Thank you very much to the Central Bank of Chile for in inviting me. Uh, and thank you very much to the translators for making sure that I don't um, you know, miss out on all the important information that people are talking about. Before I start, I'd like to get a bit of a read of the room. So if I could get everyone to just stand up for just five seconds. It shouldn't take long. So before I do my uh, talk, I want to kind of get an understanding. Please stay standing if you think regulatory sandboxes are a good idea. Perfect crowd. Amazing. OK. <laughs> This is going to go very well. Thank you very much. You can sit down now. You can sit down. Uh, so I'm Jamie Campbell. Um, I'm not a banker, although I am wearing a suit today. Uh, I, am a, uh, I work for a fintech company. Uh, I'm not an economist either. Uh, in some ways, I'm incredibly unqualified to be here talking to you. Uh, my history is in advertising. And, uh, and two and a half years ago, me and a few friends, we set up a company uh, called Bud um, because we noticed an opportunity in finance. And it leads uh, very nicely on from the presentation that, uh, that Shen shared uh, a second ago, which is noticing FinTech adoption was going to happen uh, in, on a mass scale and really producing a product which helped capture uh, that innovation cycle and uh, deliver a product which is um, you know, uh, positive for, for, for consumers. So, uh, like I said, two and a half years ago, uh, we created Bud, and, um, and what Bud does is it integrates all of these new fintech players into our platform via APIs, um, application program interfaces, creating these seamless experiences of using multiple third-party providers in one place. Uh, really, when we saw the mass adoption of, of fintech, we saw all these great providers offering, uh, whether it was uh, cheaper uh, credit or, or, or kind of new business models, and if you wanted to take advantage of all of these services as a, as a customer, you'd end up with all these different apps and websites. And if you wanted to kind of move money from here, you had to download app over here, and then I have this app here, and then I have my other website over here, which deals with my pension, and then this one over here, which deals with my insurance or, or whatever. And that just didn't seem like a very viable solution for the future. So um, we wanted to create this uh, simple place where you could use all of these products um, together. Uh, and then we uh, set about getting regulated uh, to, to do that, which was relatively complicated because actually giving customers the ability to use lots of third party providers who are all regulated themselves in one place, there wasn't really a, a kind of an understanding from a regulatory framework and from a business model framework of actually how that would work and uh, where liabilities lie um, along those journeys. So, uh, we engaged with the FCA um, as they were starting to put plans together for the FCA sandbox uh, in, in, in the UK. But before I talk about that, I kind of want to go into uh, a little bit more about the history of, of, of what we've done. So following the, uh, the FCA sandbox, which I'll talk a lot more about in a, in a second, um, we started to talk to big banks uh, in the UK and, and in Europe because what we had was a solution for a uh, technology solution which allowed any customer to use any product that they really want um, in one place. And it didn't have to be the Bud app. It could be any bank's app, you know? So when you look at some of the, uh, the challenges that banks are facing, whether it's erosion of, of sales revenues because fintechs are more competitive, or whether it's uh, the fact that the distribution of those products is so expensive, uh, really when we started to talk to, to banks, we started to realize that the product that we had built if we wanted it to, to help benefit as many people as possible, we could make it available um, to, to big banks. And there's three real strategies that we've seen uh, big banks in the UK start to, uh, start, start to adopt and start to kind of come to terms with. The first one is if you are a bank and you, don't, do, you do not offer a wealth proposition, for instance, uh, if you want to go and set up your own product and you kind of assemble a team and you spend five years building it and at the end it's not relevant because you know it's taking you five years to build it and the market's moved on. If you want to offer a wealth proposition to your customers, it's actually incredibly viable to go to a fintech provider and say, hey, you've got a really good wealth proposition, we'd like to take that and we'd like to put it in our, in our, in our bank. Problem number two. To do that kind of arrangement, it's going to take a bank probably between 9 and 12 months. And they don't have any kind of way of testing that. So what we are doing is we're partnering with banks. We're going through the procurement process of banks, which still takes you know, six, to, six to nine months. 
Um, but we're giving them a, uh, the, the ability to, uh, to pick and choose from our financial services marketplace. We have around uh, 85 different partners on, that, on, that, uh, on our platform. And they can pick and choose and say, hey, we don't, we don't offer you know, services in, in insurance. So we'll plug in these three insurance providers and these three wealth providers into our apps and websites and we'll give our customers the ability uh, to use those services. So that's the first strategy when you, uh, when you don't have a, uh, a service that, that you would like to offer to your, to your customers. The second strategy is it's actually becoming very expensive to compete with uh, fintech providers. So if uh, one of the best examples for this is in currency exchange and foreign exchange markets. Uh, if you're looking at you know, channels which aren't getting a lot of use and really it's just it doesn't really make sense for you to be kind of competing with people who have a lot lower operational um, kind of cost base, but also are offering uh, better rates. You can use a third-party provider to power those uh, those those transactions. So it means that you can kind of focus more on the core business that you're that, that you're interested in, and 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 leave those uh, those kind of like less desirable um, functions to a fintech provider. Again, that's something that we are uh, providing for our for our banking partners. And then the third strategy, which is probably the most ambitious and uh, requires a little bit of explanation around uh, a European legislation, uh, which uh, again, Shen um, touched on uh, earlier, which is PSD2. So the third strategy is in a world of PSD2, which mandates banks to, on a customer's authentication, share their personal uh, tran uh, transaction details with a technology company or, or any other regulated uh, entity to, uh, to, to perform these, these tasks, that means that they can take all the data that they get from their bank and they can have it in Facebook, for instance, and suddenly the bank loses the relationship with the customer because all the things that I want to go into and do is check my balance and, uh, and even with the, the new payments uh, directive, they can start to issue uh, demands to, to do bank-to-bank -bank transfers from within a, a third-party application. So no longer do I have to go to my bank to get all of the uh, all of the services that I'm that I'm used to used to getting from my bank. I can do it with a third party provider. Big big problem for banks because if your business model is predicated on 20% ROE from selling your services at a at a at a, uh, at a customer level, if you lose the interaction with your customer, then how are you going to get those 20% revenues? How are you going to how are you going to bring that kind of that, that money into the bank? So this third strategy is a preventative one for that, that some banks are looking at. And we're working with HSBC um, in the UK to deliver this, which is a bank that becomes the platform for all financial services. So even offering your competitors' services within your bank app, the strategy being that if you offer any service to your customer, whether it's your own or whether it's a competitor product with a better rate, doesn't matter. If you can do that, then they have no real reason to leave that interface. Because the future, the worst thing about someone going to a competitor and buying a product, what will be worse than that in the future is if they go to a competitor that is outside of your ecosystem. Because you lose the data, you lose the potential revenue for the introduction, and you could potentially lose that customer altogether. So those are the three strategies that we've been working with banks to, uh, to, to, to achieve. And as I say, we're working uh, with HSBC to deliver that, that last strategy. So that's, a, that's very exciting. So, SCA Sandbox. Um, we were involved in the first cohort of the FCA Sandbox, and uh, we, I've kind of gone and talked about the, the, the experience that we've had uh, with, with the FCA uh, in, in, in the first cohort many, many times. And the question that kind of comes up time and time again is, is the FCA Sandbox a golden ticket to regulation? As a FinTech provider, do you apply to a Sandbox and suddenly you're regulated and, and, and you know, it's a good old party for everyone? Is that the case? Well, unfortunately not, because it's actually a huge contribution for a fintech company to devise a way of going about testing your product in a safe environment that at the end has tangible outcomes that you can say to the regulator, these are the things that we wanted to test, this is the result of our test, and these are the things that we believe uh, we fall under in terms of regulation, and this is how we want to proceed uh, with the regulator. So the FCA Sandbox is broken down into three steps. There is the application process, there is your testing process, and then there is your offboarding of the sandbox. So, step one, writing an application. It's a very, very long document. You can imagine, you know, you have, uh, you have a new business that you're trying to convey how it works and a new business model that you're trying to get, um, you know, a, a real uh, understanding of the, uh, of the actual implications of, of that business model in the market. 
And so you have to write a very, very compelling and, uh, and convincing document to the FCA to say, this is a genuinely innovative approach to finance. This is something that genuinely increases competition in the market by introducing new players. And this is something that we genuinely believe is going to benefit customers. Those are the three criteria that the FCA and other regulators who are looking to do this uh, will be looking for if you are going to be entering a, a sandbox environment. Those are the criteria that they will say yes or no, this company is, is, is right or wrong. The first cohort had around 70 applicants um, and then they picked 20 and then they cut it down to 17 because for whatever reason the companies didn't make, uh, didn't, didn't kind of pass a, a, further, a further, further stringency test or maybe those companies didn't realize that it wasn't a golden ticket to regulation. And actually, when they looked at the burden of what you needed to undertake for the next five months, they thought, you know what, we'll get a lawyer to do it instead. So, after the application process, you, are, uh, you sit down with the FCA and they will tell you whether or not you are, you are in included in the, in, in the process. Um, then you have to go and do two things. You have to go get insurance and you have to get a penetration test. So these are the kind of the two key things which technically and uh, contractually say that this is a, a safe process. Um, the penetration test is very important, obviously, because it, it shows that you are capable of hand handling sensitive data from your, from your customers um, and that your technology is sound enough so that you won't have any, uh, any infringements during the test. Once you've done this, you can uh, start to um, kind of plan with the FCA when the test is going to start. And when the test uh, starts, you, you don't just kind of go into it you know, and, and hope for the best. You assess criteria that you are going to be looking for uh, during the process. Uh, and this is, comes in the form of a, of a hypothesis. So your hypothesis could be that we believe our product will make people more financially aware of their own money. Uh, it will make people more confident when choosing financial products. Uh, and it will keep uh, customer data um, accessible so that they can understand how their data relates to their finances. So those can be your, your three hypotheses, and they were the similar kind of hypothesis that, that, that we had. And then you have to outline a way in which you're going to mount, monitor that. So there's no, no good just having a hypothesis that, uh, that you don't kind of monitor. So you have to have qualitative and quantitative um, uh, me uh, measures in place. So monitoring how people are using the, how people are using the app, uh, surveying those people regularly, and then bringing those customers into your office uh, you know, on a regular basis to sit with them one-on-one -on -one and ask them how the process has been. So these are all the things that you have to write uh, as, a, as, a, as a case study before you can even start. So it is definitely not a golden ticket to, to regulation. Uh, and then your, uh, your test starts. And uh, that test can last between five and six months. Uh, for us, it was, kind of, it was, it was roughly, roughly five months. And as I said, during that process, you are testing all of the things that you said about in your, in your, in your hypothesis. Um, and you are using all of the metrics, the qualitative and the quantitative, to get real data and understanding of how people are using the product. Uh, you're understanding how the business model is actually performing, whether or not that is uh, viable for a mass, uh, for mass adoption. Um, and you are kind of talking to customers and you're understanding what they are getting from it, the benefits that they are getting from it, the tangible benefits that is going to be you know, part of the conclusion of this, of this test to say, hey, this product did this and this is what customers, customers thought. So that's your kind of five months. And during that five months, you have a weekly catch up with a representative from the FCA. Uh, in that catch-up, you are sharing things like uh, what data are we, are we getting from, from customers? Are there any complaints? If so, what are those complaints um, you know, talking about and how are people responding? Uh, how is the, the team responding internally to, the, to those complaints? So really, the FCA along this, on, along this journey, they are learning as well as you. They are understanding how this kind of business model is operating. Um, and to be honest, they are the people you know, who I would say have a better knowledge of our, uh, of our business than anyone um, outside, of, outside of the actual employees who, who work there. And that's a really, uh, a really good kind of asset to have. So you've done your test and now you're, uh, you're offboarding from, uh, from the sandbox. And offboarding from the sandbox uh, is, a, is a, another large document where you outline all of your uh, hypothesis that you wanted to test, um, you kind of throw in all the data and the proof about how, uh, how, the, how the test has gone, and then you write your conclusions. So do we, did we answer the hypothesis? Did we challenge um, kind of existing uh, predications on how people thought that this business model would work? Do, does, the business model, what, does the business model work in, in, in general? You know, is, there a, is there even a point in regulating um, this, this company? 
And then once you've submitted that, 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 uh, that conclusion, you then sit with the regulator um, and to start discuss the, the outcomes. And then, uh, and then you kind of, at the end, they make a decision whether or not they will, they will regula regulate you. It's worth saying that whilst you're doing the, the test, uh, the, way in which you, uh, the way in which you can conduct that test is you are regulated with limitations. And what that means is they uh, mandate that you cannot have more than 1,000 people using your product. And before they can use it, they have to go through a consent, um, a consent process where they describe, where you kind of describe all the things that you are going to be testing. You have to say that it is in collaboration with a regulator to, to test and understand this, this new service. Um, and then they can kind of be onboarded onto your, onto your product. Uh, and then after the sandbox, um, you know, we were we were very lucky, and we, we were regulated by the um, by the SCA. Uh, the general understanding was because we never touch any of the money, um, and all we're really doing is introducing people to to financial products. Um, the regulation that we that we needed was was rather light, and that was what the kind of the consensus of the customers were. Um, if I'm using a third party product that is regulated. Uh, we're just doing the introduction. So it was a great opportunity for the uh, regulator to test with us and understand with us uh, a new business model um, in, in finance. So I would say if you are a, uh, a regulator and you are interested in uh, competition and, uh, and the benefits that competition in the financial market can give you, if you are interested in uh, innovation, and moving at a speed that, uh, that allows for both innovation uh, and the third piece, protection, then a sandbox is actually a pretty elegant solution. We were talking earlier, um, actually, about, it's unfortunate that it was given the name sandbox because it, it kind of makes it sound a bit too playful uh, and a bit too, um, you know, uh, that it's not, a serious, it's not a serious act. I think it makes sense for a technologist because you know, you have sandboxes all the time, and we test things in sandboxes all the time. But for the general population and for other regulators looking in, maybe it makes it sound a bit, um, a bit, a bit silly. So we love the sandbox so much <laughs> that um, we've actually entered in a second time, and uh, for cohort three of the F FCA sandbox. And this is really when uh, the sandbox starts to become, um, you know, really exciting because we are entering. To, uh, to, to, to challenge and understand an existing piece of regulation around conflict of interest. So, uh, as I said earlier, we're working with, uh, with HSBC uh, and we are offering a marketplace of third party uh, financial providers to HSBC customers, a limited group of HSBC customers. Um, now, if HSBC wanted to do that themselves, then there is an inherent conflict of interest, especially if they're offering, offering competitive products from, the, from other providers. Because they, you know, you would assume that they are more likely to want you as a customer to pick up their their loan product or their pension product or their wealth product or whatever. Um, and so we are going, we're entering in with with the uh, with the bank to kind of demonstrate to the regulator that actually, if you want to offer this marketplace platform uh, approach uh, as a as a as a strategy for a bank, then really you need to have a third party intermediary to mitigate the risk of conflict of interest of selling products, selling your own products before showing the rest of the market. Um, so us as an independent intermediary, we take on the burden of that independent um, and a non-partisan uh, introduction of products to deliver a best case um, service for, for the bank's uh, customers. Really, that's kind of, uh, I guess, all that I can kind of share with you about uh, the FCA Sandbox and, and our process and how we've, and how we've grown. Um, and I'm probably will have a conversation uh, on the panel. So thank you very much for listening to me.